Welcome back everybody, this is Eric and Chad here with Iraq Veteran 8888 and today we've got another gun gripe episode for you and we're going to be talking about more of the pending tyranny in Virginia. Uh, we don't want Virginia to fall by the wayside. I know that there are a heck of a lot of other states that are going through individual state battles and we are trying our best to get to those videos as we get pertinent information about them. Uh, there are a lot of scary things happening in Virginia and we are going to dive into that subject um, a little bit here and talk about some of the stuff that's going on. And I want to take a quick moment to thank all of our viewers who support our channel. Um, I know that, you know, there are like a vocal minority of people that complain about some of the more political related videos. And uh, look, uh, we appreciate the like the gun videos and we definitely post plenty of gun content and we like to be a multifaceted channel in terms of what we do. But I do appreciate the folks that support us through programs like Man Cans, purchasing t-shirts like this one over on the website, those of you who support us on Patreon, uh, those funds are greatly appreciated and they really help us run our channel and keep our channel going. So those of you who consume the guns content, cool. We really appreciate that. Those of you who support all of our content and tune in for Gun Gripes, thank you for being an engaged citizen and trying to keep your ear to the ground just like we are in terms of things that are going on. Um, I know gun videos are fun and we have a lot, you know, really entertaining uh, in terms of the way we do things. We have plenty of gun videos on the way. Don't worry. You're going to be seeing a bit of an influx of gun gripes because there's things going on that are important that we need to talk about. Also, there's a lot of new gun owners out there and we've been making a lot of videos that are geared towards new gun owners. Do us a favor and share them with your gun toting buddies so that people can get the information they need to be safe. Okay, I just want to put that out there. So if you do support the channel, thank you so very much for supporting us in any way that you can. And if you've been a longtime viewer, thank you for continue, uh, your continued viewership. So let's get in with this thing a little bit here. Um, we wanted to kind of talk about some of the bills that have already passed in Virginia. Now, obviously, the assault weapons ban, the kind of all-encompassing assault weapons ban that everyone was really angry about, um, you know, we had the rally that went really good. We had a huge turnout for the rally and the General Assembly decided you yeah, had to drop the assault weapons ban. Unfortunately, several other uh, bills did make it through. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I believe the window of opportunity that those things are going to take effect, I think is looking at like early, Jan or early July, I think is the way it's looking. Uh, from what I understand, yeah. Yeah, okay. So we're going to talk about some of those laws and uh, they're very draconian and they're very tyrannical. And it's really a melting pot uh, of patriotism going on in Virginia right now, okay? Because there's many law enforcement officers and sheriffs in various municipalities and counties that have said we're not going to enforce gun control, okay? And those 2A sanctuary counties actually greatly outnumber the amount of places where we're saying, hey, this is, this is what time it is and this is what we're going to deal with. So it's going to be really interesting to see how it's actually enforced, if it's enforced, and how many of those LEOs actually hold up their end of the bargain and choose not to infringe on their citizens' rights. Absolutely. So um, the assault weapons ban uh, that was going through the House, it passed the House. It did not make it through the Senate because there were some Democrats that were in more pro-gun districts that turned coat, okay, more or less, and killed the bill. All right, so it was definitely... a it was definitely a result of all the uh, support of gun owners uh, from Virginia and other surrounding states coming to the Capitol and showing face at the rally um, that that probably changed those people's minds, okay? And then the, the sanctuary movement and everything, grassroots activism like that is what keeps this stuff from going on um, unregulated, if you will, and, and um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, and all the detractors, all the detractors that said, oh, rallies don't do anything, you guys are part of the problem, okay? you got to support people that are actually showing up and going to these rallies. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you there's plenty of people that sat in their mom's basement and played Xbox and didn't bother going to the rally, <laughs> but yet are the same people who are going to sit on there and complain about the people that actually got out and tried to make a difference, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't be that guy, okay? Either yep. support the effort, get out there and show solidarity, or shut up, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because you're not helping. Shut it! Shut it, boy, right now! Uh, but if you if you sit 
on your hands and just rest on your laurels and sit by the wayside like many gun owners did, okay? Things go like, things like this go uncontested and they just get pushed through because the gun owners out there that would be rallying together and fighting against this kind of stuff on a, on the legislative scale are just say, oh, well, it's not going to pass. We live in a red state. Yeah, well, that's what they thought before Northam got elected. And then the, the Senate and the House got turned over to anti-gunners in Virginia. It could happen in your state. I mean, it could happen in Georgia in the coming years. It almost happened in Georgia. So, uh, you know, it's no, no state is, is immune to these turnovers like this and this anti-gun legislation getting pushed down the pipeline. So the assault weapons ban did fail, okay? But Virginia is getting universal background checks, all right? And universal background checks basically expand the common NICS background check system that you have to go through to purchase a firearm at a retailer um, to private sales. Okay, so if you are going to sell a firearm to someone in a private manner, you will have to then go to an FFL and do a background check and fill out a 4473 and it'll have to be transferred that way. It'll have to go through NICS, okay? And it's unfortunate that that passed in Virginia because it's, it's detracting uh, to uh, individuals' rights on private interstate commerce, okay? I mean, you can do with your property what you deem fit, okay? The government is now encroaching on your privacy, telling you what you can and cannot sell, and how, if you are going to sell it, how you have to go through that process. It so. also puts into place a very unclear and unfair level of compliance. It, it, it sort of opens the door for some really shifty gray area compliance right mm -hmm. and and not not what i don't what i mean is i'm not saying oh you must comply what i mean is enforcement okay there's so many gray areas as to what constitutes a gun that's been transferred okay when did you sell it or is this one that you got from your grandpa when you were 10 years old i mean there's so many gray area things in terms of how they would actually enforce something like this that there's no standards for it. So you you know they're gonna just make the standards up as they go and they're gonna come up with as many draconian things as they possibly can to make as many people as they possibly can criminals mm -hmm. in any manner they see fit. So that is where this whole 2A sanctuary uh, is gonna come into place because how do we know that, you know, I don't know. So here's the thing. If a firearm is, in, is used in a crime, there is no such thing as a gun being in someone's name. That, that's Hollywood bullcrap. Now, certain states that have FOID cards, yeah, you might have a certificate or a, or a license that your gun is on or whatever, or like in New York, I think there's things like that. But the rest of the free world, uh, a gun is simply a piece of property, and once it leaves the gun store, it's yours, and there is no in your name. Like, people say that all the time, and it drives me nuts. Is this um, registered? A, a, a firearm can be traced uh, it is not registered. Uh, registries are illegal. You you cannot register firearms. Okay, that that's not the ATF is not supposed to keep a registry of who buys what. Okay, they'd like to, and there's even a lot of people who think that there is sort of a phantom black list that they are keeping, despite the fact that they're not supposed to. That's another another story for another day. Yeah. But firearms can be traced. So what happens is, let's say you sold a gun to Jim Bob. Jim Bob got involved in an argument with his girlfriend and then, I don't know, gunned down his girlfriend or whatever. Let's just say committed some crime, as horrible as that may be. Let's say they committed a crime. All right, well, police show up. They go, well, here's a gun. All right, they're going to look at that serial number. They're going to go, all right, how in the world do we figure out who this gun belongs to? Well, the way they do that is they go to the manufacturer and the manufacturer says, okay, uh, yeah, I sold this gun to blah, blah, blah distributor. Blah, blah, blah distributor says I sold it, sold it to blah, blah, blah gun store. Mm -hmm. Blah, 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 gun store says I sold it to Joe, Jim Bob. <laughs> and then they're going to go to Jim Bob and go, okay, who'd you sell this gun to? So guns can be traced, but only when they're used in a crime. There has to be a reason for the trace to occur. Um, so that's what's scary about this is that the enforcement end of it is so gray area that it opens up a lot of risk, not only to law enforcement who mm -hmm. are going put, to be putting their lives in danger by infringing on you know, people's rights, and they're going to push the wrong person in the wrong way. And just like with red flag laws, if someone does a no-knock warrant and a cop or a civilian gets shot over it, 
Of course, there's collateral damage that's going to occur there from an enforcement standpoint. But not only that, but the standards are very confusing, very draconian, and very unconstitutional. Okay, so mm -hmm. it just, it's scary. And, it, and it, this is also going to cause a very, very odd series of circumstances to occur too, because this is going to be the first type of taste that they get of this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Universal background checks, which many on the anti-gun side have been calling for universal background checks for years, but they don't understand the implementation. They want this feel-good legislation that lets them put a check in the box, and they don't care how it's enforced, how it needs to be enforced, the funding required, the research. They don't care about the facts or the data or statistics. All they know is this is a feel-good Band-Aid legislation. And oh, by the way, all you police people, you just worry about how this is handled. All we know is we did what we felt was the right thing, and we applied a Band-Aid to this thing. So that is the scary thing, is laws get passed in an effort to apply a Band-Aid solution to something, mm -hmm. but when people don't understand is the enforcement is either impractical, dangerous to people's lives, or the unconstitutionality, or that the statistics and data don't back up uh, the, the measure, and it makes it completely invalid, not to mention its questionable constitutionality. Yep. So, anyway, um, I just want to, you know. So, the bill does exempt a couple of things. Um, Transfers between immediate family members, things like estates and trusts and that sort of thing, obviously are exempt. It's not quite that draconian, but still, universal background checks are draconian as they sit. But It's what they lead to. It's it not what, the, what they think they're so accomplishing. It's, it's what they're actually leading to. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the ultimate goal is to get like every single firearm registered in the entire country. I mean, that's really the ultimate goal. If they register um, everything, they can confiscate everything. And, and that's what they want to be able to do. They, the whole thing is, is a confiscation theme, a mm -hmm. scheme. Mm -hmm. And they know that all roads lead to that. They do. Um, but what's happening in Virginia is just piecemeal taking away of Second Amendment rights. So yep. they got this, okay? So moving on to the future, if... Say the, the governorship flips, okay? They flip back red, all right? Whatever the case is, the, the Congress flips back red and supposedly pro-gun and conservative, right? Let's not get into all that mess. But are, how are they going to repeal this stuff? Are they going to put some bills in there to repeal uh, these particular things that passed? Repealing items that have already been put into law is extremely difficult. Um, but anyways, and they know that, and they know that. All right, so moving down the line, red flag laws. So red flag laws are taking effect in Virginia. Um, we did a video on all that mess a little while back too, and we've done other videos on red flag laws. Uh, they are wholly unconstitutional. It is seizure of your property without due process, uh, just from someone saying that you are scary and they are uh, uh, they feel threatened for their life or the life of someone else. Uh, you know, we you had guns. Uh, I feel like this person might go out and shoot up a mall or something like that. So, uh, police, go 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 take these guns from this person. And you have no idea what's going on until the police show up at your house to confiscate your firearms. There have been people that have been killed over this already, all across the country where this has been instituted. It's very scary. Okay, so you know, red flag laws are scary for a lot of reasons, and I won't go down this rabbit hole because Please we've don't. already done. <laughs> We've already done multiple videos on this, Ugh. so look up our videos on red flag laws and you'll know exactly everything you need to know. But the thing that God. red flag laws do that are the scariest is that they operate under the color of law and not actual law, really. Yeah. Okay, so someone can pass a law saying this is the law, but there's a difference between something being a law because it's what society at large needs and wants, and it's another thing for a law to be passed in, 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 in the era of tyranny and for that law to operate under the color of law. Yep. All right, Our Constitution is the ultimate law of the land, and any law that is repugnant to the Constitution is not a law and is acting under the color of law. And those are two different things, okay? You can't just will something into existence that infringes on the Constitution and just go, I really, 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 really want it, and it happens. It, it has to pass the purview of constitutionality. And that is the issue, is that red flag laws infringe on the Fourth Amendment, the Second Amendment, and the First Amendment in many different ways. And we've gone over that in other videos, but they don't pass even the worst Supreme Court justice in a million years would never, never allow that to pass the purview of constitutionality. Mm. And that's why a lot of gun laws won't ever go to the Supreme Court, because the Supreme Court 
is scared to vote on gun laws because they know that they don't pass the purview of constitutionality. And they know that if they take their oath seriously and if they take their job seriously, they know that no one in a million years could ever see how some why, where something in the Constitution says shall not be infringed, mm -hmm. it's pretty clear constitutional language. And if you infringe on it, it can't be a law. It doesn't pass the purview of constitutionality. Mm -hmm. So that is the major issue. And that's why the Supreme Court won't vote on these cases, because there's either some underhanded crap going on or someone's getting paid off or there's some big slush fund somewhere where everybody's sucking dry. Whatever the case may be, whatever the circumstances are that surround why the Supreme Court won't mm -hmm. take on 2A cases, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Okay, it's acting under the color of law. It's not the law because it doesn't pass the purview of constitutionality. Mm -hmm. I'm not a legal authority, but all I know is that the Constitution is the ultimate law of the land. And any law that goes against that is not a law. It's only acting under the color of law, which means that it's nothing more than organized crime. It's nothing more than mafia-level infringement. That's all that it is. Hmm. Red flag laws are literally the government sending the mafia after you to kill you because they don't like you. That's all it is. kind of like backing up paper money with unicorn farts rather than gold? It kind of is, Chad. It's very similar. So they're, they're literally creating a system where they can send government goons to come in your house and murder you like they murdered Duncan Limp. Okay? And they won't release the body cam footage. And I don't want to get onto that, onto that right now. But there's a lot of people that are pissed about how the situation with Duncan Limp, amongst many other red flag cases where civilians have been murdered over this crap. Okay, if someone beats down your door in the middle of the night, you're not going to stop and look for a badge. You're going to defend your home, right? You don't worry about what is going on. You're going to protect yourself. There's more responsible ways for these things to be handled and allowing a government death squad to kick in your door and gun down your dogs and your wife and you and your family in the middle of the night is not intelligent. And that's what they're basically allowing to do. They're giving these people a blank check to be able to exact tyranny on you because reasons, and using a phantom court that you're not privy to and that you don't get to represent yourself. Yep. I didn't want to get on that, but I think it's important that people understand that red flag laws are scary, they're unconstitutional, and they completely ignore due process, and they completely ignore the, the, the very, like purview of why we have laws, why we have due process, why we have checks and balances in our government, in our mm -hmm. law enforcement. They're all there to protect not only the, the officers, but also the people that laws are enforced mm -hmm. upon, right? You know, it, there's rules, right? You can't have a game and say, all right, this is a game we're going to play, and here's the rules, right? Every game has rules. Well, it's the same thing. Like, you know, if, if I'm going to be subject to some bullcrap law, I need to know what the standards are, what the rules are, and I need to know that if I break the rules, I get to ask the referee why. And then, uh, uh, you know what I mean? Like, there has to be rules to every game. This ignores those rules and says, you know what? Don't worry about those pesky rules because we don't need those rules because we're the government and we're just going to do what we want. <laughs> That's what's scary about it. One handgun per month limit. And also, oh, um, there was another bill that requires gun owners to report lost or stolen firearms to police within 48 hours or face penalties. So, like, if... All right. So, this is... I'm going to shut up. You this just, this is the thing. thing that really pisses me off about these, like, reporting laws and stuff. Like, all right, so, you, you're on vacation, okay? You've got a gun safe in your house or whatever the case is, and somebody breaks in your house, they take all the time that they want. You don't have a security system, whatever the case might be. And they open your safe up, they take all your guns. Well, you don't come home for a week. Well, is it from the time that the guns were likely stolen? Or is it from the time that you report a, th a, a burglar or something like that and realize the guns are missing? Like, what if the gun was used in a crime before you even get home? Are you to blame? So how can you be to blame for the actions of another individual that you have no control whatsoever over? You know? It, there's a deeper meaning too. I know. It's just oh, God. there's a deeper meaning. Okay, so it's not only that. It's not only the logistical, you know, the logistics of life, right? Think life happens, and we can't be in control of everything like we would like to be. And, and sometimes life happens. Oh yeah, there's the life shuffle, but I think it's a deeper meaning than that. They want a nanny state. 
They want to condition people to tell on people for anything. That is the major mm -hmm. issue with laws like these. Oh, you have to report a stolen gun. Okay, should you probably report a stolen gun? It's probably a good idea to report a stolen gun. I think we can all agree you should report a stolen gun. It is a conditioning of people to tattle on each other mm -hmm. and to weaponize the state against their fellow citizens. That's the issue. It's that it promotes that idea all around and it, it, it encourages people to be nannies. And that's the issue. That's mm -hmm. a huge part of it. It just adds to that whole red flag thing. It's a similar type of thing. Yep. It's a social and mental conditioning. As something that is wrong is perpetuated for long enough and by people that most folks are conditioned to consider the government as being helpful or an authority or whatever, not to say that's correct, but it's conditioned. If someone who's in government tells you long enough that that's the way it is, then after a while, you're going to believe it no matter if it's true or not. That's why people in Chicago think it's illegal to own a gun. Because if they ask a cop, how do I buy a gun? You don't get to own a gun. Well, even if they lied to you and told you that you're not allowed to own a firearm or that suppressors are illegal or that a pistol grip shotgun's illegal and only cops can have that, mm -hmm. if they perpetuate a lie long enough, it changes the complete social boundaries of society to accept a lie as the truth. And that's why it's scary. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of uh, what was that show on Amazon where uh, you know the the Ax Axis powers won World War II, you know, and divided up the United States. What was the name of that show? Uh, uh, Man in the High Castle. Man in the High Castle. So it makes me think. It's actually of, a really good show. It is. So it makes me think of like Man in the High Castle because you know the Nazi regime that was on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, you know they they had their own like kind of voluntary thought police. Like they would just. Uh, propagandize the kids okay to say like to tattle on mommy and daddy if you hear any uh you know non approved speak at home or right. if you're listening to non approved music or reading non approved books and things or, like that or in or in this case it would be in possession of contraband yes so it's the same idea it's like it, it, it's they don't have to have a thought police force the thought police are in in your home yeah you know it's all they it's want you to be the thought police yes. <laughs> and to and to condition you to see a pattern of behavior that they want you to think is bad yeah. and firearms ownership is a is a form of behavior that they want to condition society to think is negative and that you should turn in anyone yep. that would want to own a gun or that brandishes a gun or has a gun or anything. That's what they want it to lead to and that's why it's so scary. This is why you need to turn off the TV and stop listening to mainstream media because <laughs> you're slowly becoming conditioned. I mean, that's the problem. A lot of people are conditioned by the mainstream media to think, oh, guns are bad. Oh, this is bad. And they don't really put any logic behind it they don't really think about it it's just what they've been spoon fed so obviously it's just ingrained in their mind that guns are bad why well i don't know guns are just bad think a little bit y'all <laughs> free your minds okay don't allow mind. this indoctrination to occur you know be a free thinker use the facts look at logic look at statistics <laughs> look at the things that you see and draw informed conclusions mm -hmm. about the world around you don't allow these people to spoon feed this information mm -hmm. to you as gospel because it's yep. just completely against all logic all right so this let's is, move on this I'm is sorry. definitely something that i have a problem with all right uh people subject to a permanent protective order for abusing a spouse or living partner are barred from possessing firearms okay uh, federal law makes no provision for ins ensuring that they uh, turn over any guns they already may have, but one of the Virginia bills requires abusers to serve with permanent protective orders to surrender the guns to police, a gun dealer, or a private party within 24 hours. Um, all right, so people make mistakes, okay? It's just like nonviolent felons, okay, or felons in general. All right, you make mistakes in your life, okay? Well, people can change. I mean, there is a certain amount of like recidivism, okay, where people will just keep doing the same thing over and over again and get put back in the criminal justice system, get put back in prison. But there are a lot of people that really change, okay, and they want to move forward in their life, but a felony hanging over their heads is holding them back from everything, okay? If once you're a felon, you are barred from owning firearms, okay? Uh, so the the problem i have with that is like you nonviolent a nonviolent felons okay if you want to smoke a little bit of weed okay and then you got caught well guess what you're a felon 
Well, so you can't own a, guns. Lot of, a lot of cases, there are a lot of drug charges that are misdemeanors. And also, the th and I don't want to get off on this vein too heavy, but I will mention that there are a lot of jurisdictions that have actually um, decriminalized uh, certain forms of drug charges that would well, have, in 10 or 15 years ago, gotten you put in the slammer. So it's, it, it's, it has to do with like a certain, like basically if they get you for distribution, like if you've yes. got a large amount of some drug or something, let's say an illicit substance or whatever, um, if you have a large a large amount of that, then yeah, they can say, all right, you have the intent to distribute and that is a felony. So if you're a even drug if, dealer, even if you don't have the intent to distribute, you know they're still going to charge you with it. If you have you over know? a certain amount, yeah. yes. So, but like the city of Atlanta, there are gray area laws yeah, that like, are felonies that like, probably shouldn't right, be. So like weed, for example, is illegal in Georgia, right? Like recreational use and this sort of thing, and I want to say medicinal use too in Georgia. Um, right. But in the city of Atlanta, like if you're in possession of under a certain amount, it's no longer like a, a crime where you're going to go to jail. You're going to get fined. Okay, it's like a hundred dollar fine or something along those lines. But it still just pisses me off to think that, okay, well, even, all right, so true abusers, all right, that's one thing, but whatever the case might be. But if, if you're wrongfully accused, I mean, because this happens a lot. I mean, somebody can say, a, a, a female can say that their husband's beating the crap out of them or whatever, or emotionally abusing them, whatever the case might be. And they go to the police and they get these restraining orders. And you have to fight to get your name cleared. It's just like the red flag laws and stuff. You know, like you have no idea who's accusing you, but in this case you do, but you still have to go through the court system and fight to prove yourself innocent. Yeah, and um, who gets to determine how that per permanent protective order is issued? So you've got a jurisdiction who has already clearly shown that they are against guns because they're obviously trying to go against gun ownership. So mm -hmm. you know that the system is going to have a, a, a mm -hmm. bias towards you as a gun owner. So all it would take is a spouse going, I'm just scared of him or something. It could be the stupidest little thing. And all it's going to take is some liberal or you know, whatever, anti-gun judge to mm -hmm. say, well, well like, I guess oh, we're going to give you that protection order well, and then yeah. that's more guns off the street. So, all they're seeing is the end result and they don't care whose lives they destroy to achieve their, their yeah. result. So it's twofold. You get your guns taken away from, your, from a red flag law and then you get your guns taken away from you permanently because of the permanent protective orders, okay? Uh, I mean, all right, so uh, another bill would update the state's child access prevention law to make it a class one misdemeanor to leave an unlocked loaded gun accessible to kids under the age of 14. So safe storage laws, more or less, okay? You have to have your gun secured. Uh, if they're accessible to children under the age of 14, you could be charged with a crime. Um, let's see, Virginia, all right, power for cities and towns to establish their own gun ordinances. Uh, let's see. Virginia allows guns to be openly carried in many public settings. It allows, or it also forbids local governments from setting any firearm restrictions that go beyond laws passed by the General Assembly, making Virginia one of 45 states where the pre exemption law that curbs uh, gun safety efforts by cities and towns. So, let's see. A measure passed by the General Assembly reverses any of so right. basically, city councils and mayors can mm -hmm. exact worse gun laws than what the General Assembly's passed. So, in, basically, what they're excuse me, what they're doing is they're opening up Pandora's box for, all right, you look at those 2A sanctuary counties, right? You got some that are red areas. They're saying, yes, we're going to enforce whatever mm -hmm. the heck comes down the pipeline, right? They're giving those jurisdictions the ability to go, all right, we're going to have even more strict measures mm -hmm. than what the General Assembly has passed. So it basically gives those individual municipalities the ability to go, hey, we wanted an assault weapons ban. We wanted all of these other horrible things. It gives them the ability to pass those things yep. if they wish to. So, yeah, whereby if you live in one of the, the pro 2A counties that is now a 2A sanctuary county, they may not pass, let's say, anything worse than what the General Assembly has already passed down the pipeline, but mm -hmm. they hopefully may not even enforce what is on the book. So let's hope mm -hmm. that you've got police officers and sheriffs that are just like... Bye. We don't care. You know, screw them. If the state employees want to, if they want to send the state police down or whatever, or if they want to send the feds down, uh, they're probably, it's not like they're going to set up a roadblock and prevent the feds from coming in and enforcing federal law, or they're yep. going to prevent the state police from coming in and exacting whatever tyranny they want. It's just like the situation with the Capitol Police causing mm -hmm. a stink of, of uh, the assembly, right? When they were, you know, protesting the bills and they gave them like, what, one or two minutes? They got to say their piece, and then they're like, oh, get out or we're going to arrest you. So there are tyrants at every level, and usually the state police are a little bit more statist, obviously, 
uh, because they have you know a statewide policing ability uh, like in Georgia, we have a Georgia State Patrol. You know, they are a statewide law enforcement organization. A Georgia State Patrol officer can enforce the law anywhere in the state mm -hmm. of Georgia. Okay. Now, they have more stringent uh, requirements for training. Mm. They have a more stringent, um, you know, overview of different code and, and, and other laws that they have to enforce. And uh, they can also pull you over for going one mile an hour over the speed limit if yep. they want. If so, want state police already have an elitism, statist, type of view. So it's not stopping the state police from showing up and setting up a roadblock and then randomly checking people for compliance mm -hmm. if they want. The sheriffs and the 2A sanctuary counties are not saying that they are going to stop the state police from enforcing laws in their county. They're just saying that they're not going to do it. So the big question is, how far down the rabbit hole are these various sheriffs going to go in regards to dealing with state police conducting operations in their counties. And on top of that, is the state police going to be able to keep up with policing the entire state to enforce the laws that the General Assembly passed that the county level law enforcement officers and, and anything below refuse to do? To be determined. And that's to, to, be, to be determined. So um, the, <laughs> the big assault weapons ban was HB 961, and we did a video on Mark Levine and his uh, AR-15 manifesto a little while back up at Moss. And um, that bill was not killed, okay? It was not just killed on the floor of the Senate or anything like that. It was... It was, in, it was in the Judiciary Committee, and uh, it got shelved until the 2021 session for you know further study and such as that. Um, but anyways, it will be revived at some point or another, so people really need to be on their toes in Virginia. And um, I, I, hope that, I hope that with the craziness that's going on in the country right now and you know all the new gun owners and things like that uh, that are kind of coming into the fold and realizing what the Second Amendment and all stands for, what gun ownership really stands for, will you know vote with their feet, okay, in yep. the coming elections across the country and get some of these anti-gunners out of these uh, congressional bodies on a state level because we've said it numerous times in past videos, but the real battle for Second Amendment rights is is at a state level and. The anti-gunners know that, like people like Bloomberg, you know, they pretty much bought Virginia. Bloomberg pretty much bought Virginia with his own personal fortune. And he's working on that sort of outcome in other states as well. And uh, it just takes, uh, it, it takes people resting on the laurels and sitting on their hands and not getting out, not being active and not advocating for their rights uh, in order for these things to happen. If grassroots activism is just at an all-time low, then these people can swoop in there and just sway the, the mind of the public uh, or the eye of the public as a whole and get these, get these concepts just kind of put in motion and then it just kind of sticks with you just like hearing the same crap on the mainstream media all the time. Oh, yeah. um, but the state level battles are very important and I really hope that there's a change in the attitude towards uh, politics moving forward and just you know an overall era of freedom and not just this you know left versus right or Republican versus Democrat, whatever the case might be. It's just pro freedom or not. There needs to be a drastic change in gun culture in order to really take this thing home and get these people out of here. We've got to vote these people out of office. We've got to not sit on our hands when it comes to these state elections. The state battles are super, super important, okay? And uh, it's really important that we show solidarity with each other and that, you know, if a neighboring state is having a rally, you know, I know right now with all the crap going on, there's no rallies, yep. you notice that the, that the whole rally thing was taking a lot of effect and there was lots of rallies planned and there was you know, people really getting involved at the grassroots level and then yep. all of a sudden, bam, it just shelved everything because of this virus, okay? So, um it's important that we still contact our reps and that we still remain very vocal about all of these things. And and there, I have mixed feelings about lobbyists on Capitol Hill, okay? Because lobbying is a thing that can really get a lot of things done. Mm -hmm. However, lobbying at its, at its core really is deal-making, right? And the problem with making a deal is that each side of the, of the equation wants something in return, okay? And the way politics in our country really work 
is that in order to get one side to agree to vote yay for something that you want, they want something in return. So it's mm -hmm. always like a, There's a always buddy buddy. To There's always made, concessions yeah. and earmarks and pork and buddy biting stuff, and there's all the slush funds and black funds and all these <laughs> different things, right? There's all this butt grabbing that goes on, okay? And lobbying is no different, right? But I believe that there are gun organizations, and I, I feel strongly feel that groups like the NRA, whereby for many years, you know, they've actually been partially responsible uh, for a lot of this anti-gun legislation that we see, and that's done through the way of dealing, right? If your job as a as a lobbying group is to lobby against gun laws and you defeat every gun law in front of you like waving a broadsword against the enemy, well then if there's no boogeyman to defeat, then what what support are you going to have moving forward? People aren't going to pay maintenance to a, a gun lobbying group when everything's hunky-dory and every single evil anti-gun law has been defeated with the swing of a sword. They want chaos to ensue they want maybe a little bit of good stuff to pass through but it's all planned right it's all these people get together and rub elbows and eat eat food and drink martinis and do all this stuff and they talk about how to control everyone through the, their various narratives hey, and there's also misinformation that spreads in those organizations as well like the nra they're feeding their members a certain rhetoric i mean you look at american riflemen and the magazines and stuff they put out there they are putting out what they want you to know and the way that they want you to think and a lot of it is just this fud mentality and um you know it, it's changed in recent years but not without a lot of vocal uh protests from folks like us and tim and other um you know, other voices in the 2A community just really calling them out on their bull crap. Yeah. Um, but, you know, and that's something they're not used to. No, it's not. They're used to just kind of being in control and just having the, the control of the narrative. And, you know, they really don't anymore. I think that a lot of their membership and stuff has been faltering as of late. And then, you know, with the, the recent kind of scandals and things like that going on in the organizations and the upheavals and the leadership, it's really thrown a big blow to it. But, like, we don't want to see the NRA disbanded. Obviously, they are still... Well, they still are a, a good, like, they still are a, a large pro 2A organization at its core. On the surface. On the surface. But it's just the, the changes need to be made in the leadership and the board and how the organization runs itself. You know, organizations like Firearms Policy Coalition and the GOA are doing the real work. They're smaller organizations, but everybody thinks they need to put their money to the NRA because they're the biggest. Yeah, they might be the biggest, but it doesn't mean doesn't make them a right. But the the framework is there. It just needs new blood, and we tried to get new blood in there, and it's just been hard. It's been there, tough. There will be the perception of what is the right thing to do and what is being done, and those that are doing something, Ooh. and there will be the actual people that are doing something. And I'm grassroots helping. grassroots efforts are a really huge part of how we are going to defeat all of this anti-gun legislation, right? And when you look at all of those folks that got um, organized to that rally in Virginia, mm -hmm. the NRA didn't have nothing to do with that. It, it was, was in right the backyard, backyard. And they didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> and all these gun rights organizations want to swoop in and take the credit for what good people, average people like us and you and all of us are doing, right? Just by spreading the positive message and by getting people involved and by trying to do what mm. we can to fight this crap and to get people involved at a grassroots level. So the lobbying is a big part of this situation, right? I mean, lobbying in some situations is a necessary evil, but when you look at the anti-gunners, one thing that they are really, really successful at, and I'll give them credit where it's due in this case, is that they are really dang good at lobbying, and they have millions and millions and millions of dollars in support to buy off these politicians. So, of course, they're going to buy off Northrum and all his people because... Who do, you know, these evil people that run for government and that get into these government seats like Northrum, they don't care about you. They don't care about the people. Democrat or Republicans are relevant. They care about the dollar. They care about those lobbying dollars. They care about all the political contributions that they get to campaign and their campaign contributions. And they're going to take care of who takes care of them. Mm -hmm. The heck with the people, right? So that's the issue. Lobbying is a tool but I believe that the it's lobbying from our side of the pro-gunners, they don't want to see too much pro-gun legislation get through because they always want a boogeyman in place. 
But the rest of us, we don't have time for that. We don't care. We don't want a boogeyman. We want our rights restored. We want long lost rights brought back. We want, to, we want back what was taken from us and that we have owned and that we were born with. We don't want to hear excuses from some lobbying group. We don't want to hear excuses from the politicians. We simply want what is ours. We're not fighting to gain something back uh, that, that we somehow gave up or, or you know we compromised on and gave them something. We want what has been ours the entire time, and that doesn't have a dollar figure attached to it. It doesn't have a lobbying requirement attached to it. It doesn't have to be something a politician likes or dislikes. Mm -hmm. It says clearly shall not be infringed, and we want back what has always been ours and that wasn't theirs to take in the first place. Get fired up! People need to get pissed. They do because, and they also need they're to. They're being played by both sides, well, by the lobbyists and by the politicians. Well, you know, if it's the NRA too, it's like, well, fight this new gun bill, and by the way, don't forget to renew your annual membership and contribute today. They're not fighting anything. Choose, don't forget to they're choose your magazine. It. They're financing. Uh -huh. it. They're 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 playing ball. They're giving up something. Yeah, you might gain a little ground in this little area, but then they're just going to slip in another area. So there's, there's always a continuous pool of tyranny that you have to perceivably pay money to them to fight against. What do they call that? A Mobius loop? It is. It is completely a pyramid scheme, and it is completely an organized crime scheme. Rinse, repeat, reuse. It is. It totally is. <laughs> <laughs> they, they get a little bit here, they push back here, but it's never about actually fighting for the totality of the Second Amendment as it's written. And that is the issue. And we've got to get involved in these state battles. We've got to start pushing back at the state level. We've got to get grassroots effort really fired up with all of us as individuals reaching out to everybody we know, new gun owners, un old gun owners, doesn't matter. If you're a gun owner and you know another gun owner, it is important that you get those people involved in the fight and that we put these things together. Don't rely on some lobbying group to snake their way through something and, and sneak some crap in. Do, do the work. Put in the work to protect your rights. Okay, so look, Virginia, the situation's scary, but at least we were able to fight back this assault weapons ban. It's a tiny ship off the block, but it's something, and we've got to continue to vote accordingly and vote for people that are pro-freedom. Vote in the new people. Vote in some new blood. Give them a chance. And if they do a crappy job, get them out of here and vote someone else in. We need to have a revolving door of politicians. Make them hungry. Make them work. Make them earn that trust. Make them earn that paycheck. And if they don't earn it and they go against our wishes, get them out of here and get somebody in that will. No more career politicians. We want term limits. All of that. Indeed, they need to have some. They need to have some way of uh, removing a tyrant from office. You know, when they went out, when they went on their campaign promises. Okay, it's like, oh, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. And then they get in the office and they totally like change. Like, eh, you should be able to redact them for that. Oh well, wait, you can have a recall. Election. Let's see. You can recall. Oh, you can recall them. But I was thinking, you know, a little more extreme. <laughs> well, Just a thought. but you know, it hasn't come to that quite. But you know. People who don't think that it can are living a under lie. a rock, right. <laughs> and they're living a lie. Look, guys, I mean. <laughs> it's important. Stay engaged. Look, Virginia, stay strong. I know this is crummy, and we've got to deal with it, but we're doing everything we can to put the word out. But we're only two people. All we can do is put out the word. You know, we've all got to get together mm -hmm. and fight for our rights. We've got to contact our reps, make sure they know how angry we are about the situation, and let them know that you are going to vote them out. Like, I'm voting against you if you support this. It's important. Okay, so guys, thank you so much for watching today's video. We appreciate all our supporters. You guys are amazing. Thanks for watching. Many more videos on the way, and we'll see you soon. See you guys.